Hello everybody, good morning or good afternoon and welcome to this event organized in partnership with Milestone and Achievement. I'm Serena Lorenzi, I'm communication manager at Milestone and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. Today's event is titled Essentials of Elemental Analysis in the lithium ion battery value chain. What are we going to see today? This webinar will address the growing demand for elemental analysis in the lithium ion battery chain, from the raw materials to the battery components and manufacturing, as well as their application and recycling. So with that in mind, here is how to get the most out of your webinar today. This event will be recorded and the recording of the webinar will be sent out to all of you by tomorrow. It is worth it to mention, please feel free to share any questions whenever they come to mind using the Q&A box. Also, any thoughts or comments is welcome. We will follow up with any unanswered questions in the next 24 hours. And we will try to answer to as many questions as we can throughout the event today. Any technical issue can usually be solved by leaving the event and entering the game. But if not, then use the chat box function to communicate with the backend team and we will get you back up and running as soon as possible. So if you enjoy what you see and you listen to, please consider share the recording with your colleagues or by posting this event recording on your LinkedIn or social media profile. So, all right, I think we are ready to introduce the speakers of today. So the first one is Jean-Louis Cabral, he is a spectroscopy sales manager for Canada at Agilent. Second speaker for today is Gianpaolo Roda. He is product manager at Myson. And last but not least, Longbo Young. He is product specialist at Agilent Canada. So everything is set. Let's start from Jean-Louis who will take us into the lithium-ion battery world and needs, providing a valuable overview of the role of elemental analysis in this market. Hi, Jean-Louis. Welcome and thank you for joining. You have the floor now. Thank you, Serena, for the great introduction. So again, welcome everyone to this great webinar in lithium hand battery value chain. So what we'll be focusing on today is really looking at a cradle to cradle perspective when looking at lithium hand battery. So what does cradle to cradle perspective means is really looking at really starting with lithium extraction, different materials, synthesis, purification, they may name it, until you know going to the complete utilization manufacturing of batteries to the recycling phase so with no further ado i'm actually going to start with the presentation so when we look today into the lithium ion battery market so why is this really expanding so when we look at numbers just in 2020 the market was estimated to be the size of about 20 billion dollar us and expected to reach about 65 billion dollars in 2031 why is this very simple I mean, we look into electric vehicles today, hybrid vehicles, these needs power, a way to store the energy to allow for that vehicle to move. In addition to this, to this, we all have basically our own portable devices. How many phones do we personally have at home? I mean, how many phones, how many laptops do we carry around? This also need, those also needs to have portable source of energy, basically batteries. In addition to this, when we look into moving to greener source of energy, you can think about solar panels, you can think about wind, uh, wind uh, power uh, energy as well. You need to have some ways of storing the energy. So this is what you see also in very specific countries where they basically store their uh, uh, green uh, generated energy within large size battery containers. 
What is this for? Is basically then they can store the energy and during peak hours, they can use those container sized batteries to basically send out to the electrical grid. But you can imagine the size of the battery. You need to have a lot of technologies and material into this to make it quite efficient. So then what's really within the lithium ion battery? So like for most batteries, you have an anode, you have a cathode, you have electrolyte, separator, and binders. So what it is, is when you look at an anode, this is typically done either through carbon or non-carbon materials. Then you have cathode. This is where most of lithium is actually is within the battery. So you can have different, I shouldn't say call recipes, but different type of batteries. It could be lithium, carbonate, manganate, iron phosphate, lithium, carbonate, manganate, and aluminate. So all those have their own specificities and capacities. Then you have the electrolytes, which basically a mix of solvents with different uh, ions, cations. Again, a bit of lithium as well. You have separators, which are polymeric, uh, polymeric substrates, membranes into this. And then you have also binders. They're quite complex. So when we look at the complete lithium high, lithium high battery value chain, it starts really from the upstream, midstream and downstream, and also, and mostly recycling. So what do we mean by, uh, by upstream, midstream, downstream, and recycling? So upstream is really the extraction of the raw material. It could be lithium, graphite, cobalt, nickel. If you talk about membranes, it could be about making those polymers, you know, starting with petroleum-based products or recycling as well. Then the midstream is really looking at synthesis, name it on. But the thing is, when you look at this, this is really the traditional way of looking at the value chain. In reality, today, what we look into this value chain is really a cycle. So all major organizations now look into both upstream, so the uh, supply chain, midstream being manufacturing, downstream being the application, and then recycling is taking back what actually being used in the marketplace after some years and putting it back within, within, within really the manufacturing and retailization of the material. But for simplicity today, we'll really focus on the traditional perspective of this, traditional visibility of this. So what we'll be focusing on today is really elemental requirement, elemental testing requirements to those different steps. So why do we have to test for purity and quality? So when you look at upstream, so for example, focusing specifically now at metals, so lithium per se, uh, why looking to this into the mining step is really for exploration when you do the characterization of the ore deposit, the size, the grade, the quality, that will also impact the processing. So how do you do processing, which is the extraction process through different uh, chemistry process. And then there's also checking on the environmental process. So when you generate such that large, large size mining operations, you also have to assess the impact on the environment looking at the leach, name it all. Then there's also through the midstream, what we call the raw materials and the manufacturing. So when you look at the quality of the raw materials, so if you're talking about the metals, if there are many of the impurities, typically use AA, ICP, OES, or ICPMS, but primarily ICP, OES within that, that field. You can also look at the different components. Again, as I said, the cathode, anodes, the electrolyte, major elements throughout all of this, and also mostly trace impurities. And finally, which is not necessarily finally, we also have to look at the quality of what's actually going through to the recycling process, because you need to make sure that what you're gonna be putting back into your process is at the highest quality to keep that quality of your batteries throughout the entire process. So typically organization will do, and we've seen it, actually we have uh, several customers doing this. You're looking at the, what we call the useful recyclable, recyclable metal. So it could be lithium, cobalt, manganese, nickel, copper, iron, and to name, uh, only to name a few. In addition to this, when you look into batteries, you can also recycle polymeric compounds. You can also recycle some of the ions in there. All this is all achievable and being achieved today within the industry. Again, question goes back to why testing for material purity and quality? I mean, all this is very simple. You need to ensure that what's coming in is of the best quality to ensure performance. So you can talk about capacity, voltage, the weight of your battery, which is also impact quality materials, any sort of memory effects, stability, and longevity. 
But more and more, we see companies now really focusing on how can they ensure that the batteries are safe. There's no heating, overheating, burning, resulting from that, uh, uh, of that uh, heating up. So this is actually part of that process. Plus, consistency. You need to make sure that from battery A to battery B, going through again through the recycling, you keep that consistency, power, and, and reliability. Companies also look at revenue optimization. So what's coming in also needs to be the same so you can keep always that revenue for the best battery possible. And finally, but not least, environmental concerns. So you need to test for all of that throughout the entire process. Then what we're gonna be really focusing on today is how do you accurately test for material purity and quality? So throughout that complete life cycle. So what it is today, two main points we'll be focusing on with my colleagues. So it'll be sample preparation and ethical methodologies and considerations. So on this, I'd like to pass it back to you, Serena. Thank you. Thanks, Jean-Louis, for the clear presentation and perspective in the lithium ion battery markets. It is now the turn of Gianpaolo Rada from Myson, who will guide us through the sample preparation procedure and techniques for elemental analysis of several raw materials and components. Hi, Gianpaolo, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Serena, for the introduction and welcome in this uh, part of uh, the event uh, where we will spend uh, some uh, words about uh, the sample preparation. We have already seen the importance of elemental analysis uh, during the presentation of uh, Jean-Louis and uh, that uh, basically the target of the analysis is to check the quality of the material or to check the composition of the raw materials. But anyway, what is really interesting for the sample preparation is that uh, um, the, there are many different kinds of samples. There is a big vari variety of, of components with the different uh, methods. So we have to be aware that uh, the methods for sample preparation could be different according to the materials that uh, you have to prepare for the analysis. So batteries include components of uh, oxides, metals, polymers, solvents, and all of them requires a specific sample preparation method. But later I'll give you more details about this. Uh, the analysis, the elemental analysis, it's basically a sequence where uh, we start from the sample preparation, we move to the analyzer, and then uh, we collect the final data. So as already mentioned by Jean-Louis, the major uh, system to analyze elements uh, is uh, using ICP. And the ICP system works with uh, liquid solutions. So it is not uh, possible to inject into an ICP a solid sample. And uh, that means that uh, you have to, perform, to, to do a sample preparation in order to dissolve the solid particles into a liquid phase that can be injected into the ICP system. Uh, to do this operation, basically, you start from the sample that is uh, reduced into a fine powder, homogeneous and fine powder, and then this powder is then digested. That means uh, it is uh, dissolved into a liquid phase. The digestion of uh, uh, of the samples take place uh, just mixing the sample with uh, inorganic acid like uh, nitric or sulfuric or uh, hydrochloric acid or, or any kind of acid that you see listed in this, this uh, slide and uh, we heat up uh, the solution and the sample at very high temperature procedure at very high temperature conditions sorry in that way we um, we have we dissolve the organic the, the organic material and the inorganic materials but anyway we dissolve the particles into the liquid phase and then we obtain a solution like the one that you see in that picture that is ready for the dilution and ready for the analysis with the, the ICP system having said that uh, uh, 
what is the typical approach of a digestion? There are uh, many different samples, as we have seen, that uh, uh, of the lithium ion batteries. And the samples uh, can be organic or inorganic. Organic samples are carbon based samples, uh, like food uh, or pharmaceutical or any uh, petrochemical uh, uh, product. And uh, the digestion of this kind of sample is uh, quite easy because uh, you just uh, mix the sample with nitric acid, in some cases also with peroxide, and you heat up the solution in a temperature between 180 degrees and 220 degrees. Concerning the inorganic samples, uh, the sample preparation, the digestion, it's a little bit more complex because uh, the inorganic materials are very different in terms of composition and we have oxide uh, metals or rock powders and usually the chemical bounds of the structure of this uh, material is very very stable that means that for each sample you have to use a specific acid mixture according to the to the composition to the nature of the sample that you are going to digest and of course uh, you, due to the very stable structure that these samples have you have to work at very high temperature conditions, in some cases, even up to 280 degrees. So if we consider the lithium ion batteries uh, components, let me say that most of the components are from the inorganic uh, group. So most of them require specific application, specific method in order to obtain the complete dissolution of solid material. Having said that, there are uh, different technologies available that allow you to perform a digestion. The main technologies used uh, in a lab are eating plates, like the one that you see here in this picture, or microwave system. The heating plates uh, are basically a simple uh, uh, hot plates, okay, that are usually placed under a fume hood. And on these hot plates, uh, we can place uh, our uh, beakers that can be in glass or even in Teflon and uh, we put the sample, we weight the sample in the beaker and we add the acids, the inorganic acids that we need to perform the digest. On the other uh, side we have the microwave uh, systems and microwave systems can be rotor based like the one that you see uh, here or can be a microwave single reaction chamber. Later, I give you some, uh, uh, some information. So I, I explain you the difference between these technologies. But uh, if we consider eating block uh, digestor and microwave systems, nowadays, uh, the most common uh, technique used to digest the sample is uh, using the microwave. And this was also confirmed by your answers uh, of the of the questions that you answered during the during the registrations, where most of you we have seen that already use a microwave system to prepare the sample in the lab. Why why the microwave is the most used technology for a sample preparation? Basically, because with the microwave you really you are really able to reduce the time of sample preparation, so the productivity is much higher then you can reach very high temperature conditions. And uh, this means that you can perform uh, the digestion, the quality of the digestion is much better and you can perform digestion of uh, a big variety of samples. So there are advantages that uh, of course make uh, the technology, the microwave closed vessel technology, the best uh, uh, technology for, to prepare the sample for ICP analysis. And uh, as I told you, the microwave, uh, uh, there are several different microwave systems uh, available on the market. The, the rotor based and the single reaction chamber are uh, the two main use technologies. And the rotor based technology, basically it means uh, uh, it's a microwave oven like this one. And this oven works in combination with the rotors and there are different kinds of rotors according to the application where uh, each rotor has uh, vessels where uh, 
you put the sample and the reagents inside here. The particular things of the microwave system is that uh, we measure the, the reaction, we control the digestion reaction through a temperature sensor. So microwaves usually uh, works uh, with programs made by time and temperature, and then the unit automatically does the amount of energy in order to follow the temperature profile. In our case, we use a an infrared sensor that uh, works in a special frequency transparent to Teflon. And with our unit, you can have the complete, uh, you can see the temperature in all the positions. But anyway, all rotor-based technologies nowadays work with a temperature sensor. What is extremely important when you are evaluating a unit like that uh, is uh, the configuration. So the rotor, that you need. And if we consider lithium ion batteries components, as I told you, most of them are inorganic. And it means that you require a system that is able to reach very high temperature conditions. For that reason, the best configuration for this kind of sample is of course the use of a high temperature and pressure uh, rotors. So a rotors like this one, that you also see in the picture, it's uh, usually highly recommended for the digestion of uh, very uh, complex uh, sample matrices like the lithium ion uh, batteries components. The other technology available is the single reaction chamber. So this is not a microwave oven, but it is a, a microwave reactor. And it is a stainless steel reactor, so it's able to uh, reach very high temperature and pressure conditions, much higher than, than any other rotor-based system. Of course, the stainless steel reactor is uh, protected by a Teflon liner. And uh, basically, it, instead to work with, uh, um, with rotors, it works with the test tubes. So you just weight the sample into the test tube, you add the into the vials, you add the reagents, the inorganic acids you need to complete the digestion, and then the unit, uh, and then you introduce the vials into the reactor. When the unit is closed, introduce a nitrogen gas, and the nitrogen gas close the vials, so it's a pressure that closes the vials, and then start the microwave program. After the microwave program, the samples are completely dissolved into the liquid phase, and then uh, you can open the reactor and uh, you have your final solutions ready for the dilution and analysis with ICT system. So we have seen uh, these uh, uh, different te technologies available, and we have seen that the lithium ion batteries are mainly inorganic. So that means that uh, uh, the, the, the digestion and the sample preparation of this sample could be not so, so easy to perform. So it's very important that in your lab, you have the right technology for sample preparation and the right configuration to digest uh, such uh, complex samples. But it is also very important that uh, you have the right application note to, in order to fully digest the sample that you have to prepare. And uh, in that sense, uh, for these things, uh, uh, for the application fields, milestone can really help because uh, we have uh, now more than 30 years of experience in digesting very different kind of uh, inorganic materials. And um, for this reason, we uh, apply our knowledge in the lithium ion on lithium ion batteries samples. And we made this uh, compendium, we made this uh, book where you can find uh, different application guidelines that can help you to uh, completely dissolve uh, your sample, to prepare the sample for the analysis. Uh, I collected just a few examples that you can find in the book uh, just to give you an idea about uh, the, the, the application that you can find. And uh, we start from uh, this material that it's a uh, raw material, it's a spodumene. And uh, 
this is a basically it's a rock powder and most of you know what I'm, what is a spodumene material and uh, it's interesting that for this material we use a, a combination of acids of sulfuric phosphoric and diluted hydrofluoric acid there is a specific reason why we choose these reagents the sulfuric and phosphoric uh, was uh, used because uh, these uh, allow to increase the oxidation, so helps to break the chemical bounds of this material, and also helps for the dis dissolution of alumina that could be present, that is present into this, uh, this uh, uh, material. And interesting is also the use of diluted hydrofluoric acid. Hydrofluoric acid is used for dissolution of uh, silica that is present into the spodumin. But uh, we dilute it and we do not use concentrated acid in order to avoid the formation of uh, silicon fluoride that are very volatile. So in that way, you can perform the analysis also of silicates. So you can have uh, the full recovery even of volatile elements like silicate. The other interesting part is related to the digestion conditions where we work at 230 degrees with the rotor base and 280 degrees with the single reaction channel. Remember that with this unit, I can reach very high temperature conditions. And uh, working at higher temperature conditions allow uh, us to reduce the time of the sample preparation. In that case, 30 minutes here and 20 minutes here, and uh, to reduce the volume of the acid. So thanks to the high temperature conditions, we were able to halve the volume of uh, sulfuric and phosphoric acid. Another example that I want to take uh, here is uh, the, it's a cathode and it's lithium manganese oxide. This was digested with a mixture of hydrochloric and nitric acid. And this mixture was made with three parts of hydrochloric and one part of nitric. This kind of uh, acid mixture is uh, well known as aqua regia. And uh, uh, when you prepare this, uh, this uh, solution, you have uh, a strong generation of vapors. That, and these vapors are made by chlorines. And the chlorines are very, very useful for the dissolution of oxides and metals. Even here, the digestion temperature used was different, 230 degrees that uh, for this uh, uh, unit and uh, uh, 250 degrees uh, with uh, the SRC technology. Uh, working at higher temperature again, it was possible to reduce uh, the, the, the volume of uh, the acid. So we perform, uh, we prepare half gram of uh, lithium manganese oxide with only four milliliters of acid using this technology. Even the time is a little bit shorter here, but it's just five minutes less uh, compared to the rotor based uh, technology. And the last uh, example that uh, I want to show you, the last, applic last application that I want to share with you, it's, uh, it's graphite uh, sample. Graphite is used as a anode in, in the lithium batteries component. And uh, graphite, uh, I think uh, that is one of the most difficult samples to digest because it's a very, very stable, very, very difficult. It's very, very difficult to, um, to break the, the carbon bonds of, the, of graphite. So after a huge experience on this, uh, huge work on this uh, material, we were able to find a good way, a good acid mixture that allow us to, uh, to fully dissolve this, uh, this material. So we use uh, sulfuric acid, perchloric acid, and vanadium standard solution. We use sulfuric and perchloric acid just uh, to have a very strong oxidation energy and to break the carbon bonds. And we add 500 microliters of vanadium standard solution just because of this uh, further increase the oxidation energy and basically it works like a catalyst. So instead it takes uh, several hours to complete the digestion with the sulfuric and uh, uh, perchloric acid with the injection of vanadium, 
we were able to reduce this time in one hour. So at the end, with just one hour program, you can digest graphite sample. And again, temperature for the SRC technology is much higher. So uh, thanks to this uh, technology, we were able to uh, reduce the volume of sulfuric and perchloric acid. So if you, these are just three examples that I, that I collect from the, the ebook that you can uh, that you can see in the ebook you will find many other uh, application notes but anyway we have seen in, during this uh, presentation that uh, the digestion is a mandatory step because most of samples uh, that you are going that you have to analyze are solid materials and solid materials needs to be dissolved into a liquid phase for the analysis with IC the sample preparation of these materials could be quite complex because, uh, um, because our, most of them are inorganics, so you need high temperature conditions, complex acid mixtures. And uh, uh, let me say that the best technology, of course, for this kind of preparation of these uh, materials is microwave. And Milestone provides both rotor-based technology, the ETOSAP, and a single reaction chamber technology, the ultra wave that you see here, that are both a reliable solution for, full, for to fully digest uh, all these samples. And then the technology with uh, the application support that we provide, I uh, believe that even the application support, it's a good, it's a, a useful part uh, that can allow you to speed up the method development process for sample preparation. So that's all from my side for the sample preparation. I thank you for uh, the attention and uh, I leave the floor back to Serena and see you later for the question and answer session. Thank you. Thanks Gianpaolo for this practical overview of the sample preparation step and of its role in elemental analysis flow. But before we pass to the next speaker, I'd like to remind you to enter your question in the Q&A box or in the chat box. We are going to have the Q&A session right after this presentation, so don't hesitate to ask your questions. Now, I'd like to give the floor to the next speaker, Longbo Yang from Agilent, who will cover the analytical parts by providing insights of, of what modern techniques allow to achieve even on complex matrices like the one used in the lithium ion battery market. Hi, Longbo. Thank you for joining. You have the floor. Thanks, Serena, and thanks Jean-Louis and Jampa for their great insights on the lithium ion battery supply chain and sample prep process. And now we have the samples in the acidic solution. How are we going to analyze them? To answer this question, I'm going to talk about the solutions that we Agilent offer to tackle the challenges in elemental analysis for lithium ion battery materials, specifically with the ICP OES. Just an overview of the topics we will be covering today. I will be very briefly going over the elemental testing needs for lithium ion battery materials. And then I'm going to switch to the instrumentation side and talk about what are the considerations when it comes to picking an atomic spectroscopy instrument for your analysis. For your analysis. And why we choose ICP OES for these applications. I then will show you some real world examples with lithium brines, cathode, anode materials, and touch upon a little bit about recycling also. So earlier, both of the previous speakers touched upon the battery supply chain, so I won't spend a lot of time here. The point is that every step of the way, we need to test it from the mining to raw materials to battery grade materials to recycling. These are all needs to be tested. But one thing in common in most of these analyses is that we will be looking at multiple elements with a wide range of concentration in complex matrix. So the correct analytical instrumentation and methods become crucial for the success of these testings. Agilent offered an array of atomic spectroscopy instrumentation for elemental testings. 
for the from from the tried and true AA technology to the innovative MPAES to the workhorse ICP OES and then the high end ICP MS and ICP QQQMS. All of these are very capable instruments in their own regard. So the question becomes which one to choose for the applications we're talking about today. So when it comes when a customer comes to um, comes to us to, about choosing the instrument, the first thing we always ask is what we are analyzing. Like this usually determines the sample matrix, the TDS level. For people who don't know TDS, TDS meaning the total dissolved solid level. And then we look at which elements we are analyzing and how many of them. Are we looking at one or two elements or are we looking at 10 or 20 or even 50 elements? And at what concentration, at what detection limit do we need? Do we look at PPB or tensor PPB level or do we like look at PPT? Sample throughput is also an important consideration. Some lab runs over a thousand samples per day and some ran 20 samples per week. And then we look at budget and logistics and all that, but these are the most important considerations when it comes to choosing an instrument for your application. So as we talked about earlier, for the lithium iron battery materials, we're looking at multiple elements testing with a wide range of concentration in complex metrics, sometimes high TDS samples. And at the same time, we need low detection limits to measure the impurities in high impurity materials. These characteristics require an instrument that has multiple element capability, high TDS tolerance, robustness, low detection limit with a large dynamic range, and the potential of running high, super high sample throughput. And ICP OES is the best instrument to fit all these requirements. So a brief overview of how ICP OES works. We need a sample introduction system to get the sample in solution to the nebulizer. The nebulizer will convert the liquid sample into tiny liquids, droplets, or aerosols. So the bigger droplets or aerosols will hit the inner, inner wall of the spray chamber and drop out as waste. And the small aerosols will go up into the torch and gets dried, vaporized, atomized, or maybe even ionized in the hot argon plasma. So the excited atoms and ions will emit light, which can be viewed radially or axially, or radially and axially. This light will be directed into the polychromator, which works like a prism that separates this light into different wavelengths and project them onto the detector, which records the intensity of all these wavelengths. And here is our Agilent 5900 ICP OES. We have a lot of award-winning designs and innovations, such as polychromator with a one-of-kind patent-pending freeform optics, the synchronous vertical dual view capability, as well as the solid state RF generator, and the third generation Vista chip detector. Our 5800 VDV ICP OES is essentially the same instrument with the only difference being it doesn't have the AVS and the SVDV capability to start with, but we can add them on as accessories. I can go on and on about the bells and whistles about our instruments, but that's not why we're here. What we really want to get into is to talk about the challenges and the solutions of lithium ion battery material testing. Here, I listed a few of the most important challenges when dealing with these materials. The first being the easily ionized element effect, because lithium itself is an easily ionized element. And then some of the applications, we have high TDS samples, and that is hard on the instrument and also brings physical interferences the complex matrix also brings spectral interferences and a complex spectral background. So just a little bit background on EIE fact. To put it simply, a lot of EIEs in the plasma will lose their electrons, which change the electron 
density in the plasma and in turn promotes the atomic emission. And the biggest impact would be on the group one elements or some of the group, group, group two elements. It also suppress ionic emission for some elements and create a negative bias. So if the calibration standards are not properly matrix matched with the sample, the results will be less accurate. High TDS samples are tough on the instrument in a way that it will precipitate solids and clog the nebulizer and the injector of the torch. It will also cause a lot of carryover issues and reduce the lifespan of the consumables. It might even cause the plasma to go out if you have a horizontal plasma. It will also create a lot of non-spectral and spectral interferences, which requires matrix matching or standard addition method to deal with. So this means some of the wavelengths that are less sensitive might be more important now because the sensitive ones might have too many interferences. So what solutions do Agilent have, do we have? Our ver VDV vertical dual view system supports a vertical torch with a robust solid state RF generator and the cooled cone interface to help dealing with high TDS samples. The radio viewing can reduce the EI effect while the axial viewing has the highest maximum sensitivity. We have a wide range of sample intro system to accommodate different type of applications, whether it is HF or organic or high TDS, we can handle it. The third generation CCD detector with over 98% coverage from 167 to 785 nanometer wavelengths offers the largest wavelength selection capability on the market to avoid spectral interferences. And when we can't avoid that, we have the fast automated curve fitting technique to deconvolute the an analyte signal from the interferences. Our fitted background correction is really, really good when dealing with structured background and the smart tools in our ICP will help you maximize the uptime and alert you of any issue before the issue wastes any of your analytical time. And now let's get into some samples. We have a lot of customers in North America working on direct lithium extraction technology from lithium brine. So they are analyzing brine for lithium content as well as other major or trace elements. The challenge with brine samples is that the TDS is extremely high and full of sodium and potassium, which causes EIE effect. Because these are natural samples, the concentration range from some elements are very large. And on top of that, you can end up with unknown compositions because they are geological, geological samples, which makes the developing methods much more challenging and time consuming. To deal with the EIE effect, we use radio viewing for all analytes because the concentration of the analytes here in this application are not extremely low. So the radio viewing is sensitive enough for this application. We have an argon humidifier to reduce precipitation of solids and semi-demountable torch and, or fully demountable torch for easy cleaning and replacement. We also have the advanced valve system to reduce carryover and improve your productivity by two or even three times. There is a multi-calibration feature in our software to extend the linear range using multiple wavelengths, but reports the final results in one single column. To deal with non-spectral interferences, we picked a suite of internal standards to accurately correct for all analytes. And finally, to gain insight into unknown samples, we have the IntelliQuant screening tool. So the IntelliQuant screening comes a long way of development and now it's the third, second generation of this feature. What it does is it quickly looks at the samples and give a semi-quantitative results on all the elements in the sample. It creates a heat map and a pie chart so you can easily see which elements are at what concentration level. 
it doesn't just look at one wave wavelength of an uh, element, but several different lines to avoid false positives from interferences. And the star ranking system can tell you which wavelength to avoid when you develop your method. This tool has been a really handy tool for method development. And in fact, the first thing we do when we receive customer samples is to run IntelliQuant on them. And uh, please stay tuned for the results for this uh, lithium brine analysis. Uh, it's, uh, we, we're, we're writing an app note at the moment and it's gonna come out very soon. So lithium carbonate, however, is slightly different. In lithium carbonate, we are looking at the impurities that are at trace level, which requires the sensitivity of axial viewing instead of a more robust redo viewing. However, sodium and potassium are heavily affected by the EIE effect because of the high lithium content in the sample. So in this case, we're still gonna choose axial viewing for the maximum sensitivity, but we do need to either synthetically matrix match the calibration standards to the samples by adding high purity lithium carbonates into the calibration, st calibration standards. Or we can use the method of standard addition, which minimize the difference between the standards and the samples. So when viewing axially, our cooled cone, our cooled cone interface can prevent the cooler plasma tail from being viewed by the optics, which reduces interferences and improves the system's tolerance to high TDS. For some of the elements, the spectral background is complex and structured, which is where our fitted background correction really shines. It mathematically models the complex background and gives you the accurate background correction. For example, here, we can see that the FBC correctly modeled the interference of niobium on the lead 200 nanometer line. And if we compare these two back graphs, first of all, you can see axial viewing gives you much better sensitivity, a bigger signal. Second of all, at the same time, the FBC does a much better job of correcting the background than the off-peak left or the off-peak right, because these are not, these are biased. So these are, these are results from a standard addition analysis and our spike recovery is phenomenal, indicating really good accuracy of the analysis. The method detection limit is very, very low, more than enough for this application and the long-term stability test shows excellent stability with the RSD less than 2% for all of the elements over two and a half hours. For cathode material, we picked the nickel cobalt manganese ternary material. Similar story here, we're still dealing with a lot of lithium in the matrix, so high EIE. So this time we're analyzing major elements alongside with the trace elements, major element being major element being lithium, nickel, cobalt, manganese. So we need radio viewing for major elements and axial viewing for impurities. This is the require this is the requirement. Excuse me, that that uh, one of our customer showed us, and we can see the impurity level is pretty high. You, you don't really need extreme high sensitivity to look at these. So we can do a total dilution factor of a thousand, which minimize the matrix effect and still easily get good signals on all the impurity elements. So we tested NCM materials we purchased from the market and we got excellent results with great repeatabilities and accuracy. Oh, one more thing, because currently there are not enough standards in place for the impurity of these materials. So the more data you can show to your customer, meaning more elements measured, the lower the concentration of these elements, the higher the price. IntelliQuant can look at everything in your sample at the end of each analysis. So even your customer wants to know 
something that wasn't analyzed in your analysis, you can still give them some semi-quantitative results. So for graphic analysis, the analysis itself is not very challenging because the matrix is um, very clean because the carbon is already burned uh, during the digestion process. However, because we're looking at very low impurity here, the sample and the calibration standards preparation becomes the key. In order to analyze sodium, silica, and boron at low PPB level, it is very important to avoid contamination from glassware. In fact, I recommend to use plasticware to prepare all your samples and calibration standards for all these applications. Excuse me. And finally, analysis for recycling material is not that much different from other ones because they are the same range of materials. But the sample type or concentration might vary a bit. This means that we, good, we need good internal standards select, selection to account for the matrix effect for all the elements and use multical for the elements that have a big concentration range. One thing I want to mention here is that sometimes we have spectral interferences that we just simply cannot avoid, especially when it comes to nickel, cobalt, or iron matrix. But we can still use fact to deconvolute the mixed signal and get accurate results. For example, here. So these are real spectrums from samples that we analyzed for a lithium recycling company. And what you're seeing here is I overlaid three peaks in the same graph. The blue one is what appears to have 1.84 ppm of zinc. The yellow one is a sample that appears to have 113 ppb of zinc. And I also overlaid the 500 ppb standard for reference. But if we look carefully, you can see the peak doesn't really match the standards perfectly. And if we look up in the interferences table, we can see there's a, we know there's a lot of nickel in the sample. So we can see actually there's a nickel interference line right next to the zinc. So then we performed fact modeling and found that in this sample, in this one, there is actually no zinc. All of the peak is from nickel. And in this one, we only have 27 ppb of zinc instead of the 113. The rest of them are contributing are contributed from nickel. This is really a powerful tool that we usually we like a, we routinely use this to solve for interferences. So lastly, I want to point out uh, where you can find most of this information I presented today, and some of the information we're writing the uh, app notes to come out soon. We also have a brochure that details all the solutions that we have lithium ion battery industry, not just limited to atomic, but also GC and other testing instrumentation. We have a web page dedicated to this too. We have several app notes that are targeting battery materials. We also have on 24 pages and webinars coming out or already recorded and published online. They are all free. I'm also, I'm personally, <laughs> Uh, I'm also available for any question you might have, and this is my email address. Thank you very much for your time. And now I will give the floor back to Serena and take some questions. Thank you.